Okay, so let's get started. Um, the material for this morning, the today's lecture is going to be a continuation of the lecture that we started uh, last time on the structure of complex systems, and this is part two. Sorry. Um, and then the. The information that we are discussing is coming from chapter three of your textbook. So again, you, you have access to this uh, textbook in, in your library. You can get the electronic copy of the book. So if you're interested in reading on this chapter, especially for answering the questions in the homework, you, are, you, are, you have the, the book available online. So these are the three uh, topics that we are going to discuss this morning. The, um, system building blocks which we started discussing last time and we are going to talk about the systems environment and, and why it's, it's important to always consider the, the environment and then finally the the concept of interfaces and interactions um, which is which I have mentioned a couple of times already the importance of having uh, good interfaces so when you put together the, the overall system you know that it works and it works as it's supposed to work. So from um, so we can split this first part into two into two uh, portions uh, system building blocks. We have the functional building blocks which are the functional elements and then we also have the physical building blocks which are the actual components. And as we discussed last time, there are six different or six levels within the uh, hierarchy structure of a system. Okay. And let me see if I can right here. So I'm just going to write them here at the, on the board. The first one is the, the part. Second one, subcomponent. The third one is the component. Fourth one is the subsystem. Fifth one is the system, and at the top we have the interaction between multiple systems, what we call the systems of systems. Okay, so those are the six um, levels within the complex system, and this is the hierarchical structure that we defined last time. And we also presented an example in which we were considering a, a car. So you can go from the park part uh, level and consider things like uh, a bolt or a nut, and then move to the subcomponent in which you're going to create a year, and then move into the component level in which you can have the transmission. From there, you can move to the subsystem in which you can have the drivetrain of the car. And then at the system level, you will have the car. And then at the system of system is how the system interacts, for example, with the roads, uh, with the maintenance uh, locations, uh, and so on. And, and that's the hierarchy that we have defined in terms of the structure of the system. Um, an important and generally on, on recognized finding resulting from an examination of this res, uh, hierarchical structure of a variety of complex systems is the existence of an intermediate level of elements of type that record in a variety of systems. Um, so devices such as components have these four areas, signal receivers, data displays, torque generators, containers, those are considered to be components, right? Um, and here we have additional 
examples of the different levels and what will be considered a part, for instance, as a component, for instance, and so on. The three basic entities that constitute the media in which systems operate are the following. Information, which is the content of all knowledge and communication. The second one is the material, which is the actual uh, substance of all physical objects. And the third one is the energy, which energizes the operation and movement of all the active com system components. So at the component level, we have these three basic entities that constitute the media of within uh, the systems operate. So when we talk about information, these elements can also be subdivided into two classes. The first one is are the elements dealing with uh, propagating information. For example, the radio signals or signal elements. And the second one are the elements dealing with stationary information, such as the computer programs. These are data elements. So signal elements and data elements are part of this group that is called information. And every system will deal with this three areas. Okay, so these are uh, basic entities that constitute the media for a, a system operation. So within the information again, we have two elements, the signal elements and the data elements. Signal elements deal with propagating the information. So um, radio frequencies or any other way of passing the information. And then you have the actual component that um, deal with the data or the information that you're receiving, right? which are the data elements. Um, so based on that um, split of the information element, we have, instead of three, we end up with four. And these are listed here. The signal elements, which are the ones who sense and communicate the information. Data elements, which are the ones who interpret, organize, and manipulate the information. We have the material elements, which provide structure and transformation of the materials. So the actual uh, body of the, fit of the system and also how that is transformed. And then the energy elements, which are the ones who provide the energy and um, have the power of movement, for instance. The selected elements must be self-consistent and representative. And three criteria may be used to ensure that each element is neither trivially simple or, or nor inordinately complex and has wide application. And these are the three criteria. First one is significance. Each functional element must perform a distinct and significant function, typically involving several elementary functions. Two, singularity. Each functional element should fall largely within the technical scope of a single engineering discipline. And number four, commonality. The function performed by each element can be found in a wide variety of system styles. Okay, so when we identify these elements, they have to be self-consistent and representative and we have these criteria to evaluate whether that is the case. One of them is significance, the other one is singularity, and finally, commonality. So the first two, I think, the last two are very simple to identify. So if you, if you find the element, let's say you're dealing with radio frequencies, you know that mostly fall between, between the, or in the uh, area of electrical engineering, communication systems, and so on. So singularity, commonality, the functions performed by each element can be found in multiple systems. So radio frequency, you can find it in, in I don't know, cell phones, networks, and uh, wireless networks, and, and so on. Um, so here we have 23 functional elements five or six in each class. Uh, so we have here the system functional elements. 
and they are listed on the left side part of the of the table and then we have the functions which we have not defined up to this point these are the functions that are part of the signal and then we have some applications so if we look at the signal element class function generate transmit distribute and receive signals use in passive or active scene and in, in uh, and in communications so here are some functions that are part of this class uh, input getting the input signal transmitting the signal trans, uh, transduce signal receive signal process the signal and then output signal so very very elementary functions and but they are you're familiar with those right you, you know that if you are going to receive and pass that information there are zero functions that will happen and then we have some applications for each one of the functions, so input signal, the TV, uh, camera, uh, transmit signal, a FM radio, uh, transduce signal, a, a radar antenna, receive signal, a radio receiver, and process signal, an image processor, output signal, the TV2. Um, and we can go through each one of them for the data, analyze, interpret, organize, query, and convert information into forms desired by the user or other systems. And these functions are somehow similar. So we have the input data, process data, control system, control processing, store the data, and now also outputting that data. If we look at a computer, these are the functions in the application. So keyboard, computer, CPU is the one that is going to be in charge of processing the data. The operating system will be controlling the system. Um, word processor is a control processing in which you are telling the machine what to write. Um, the store data, you, you have the CD uh, or the magnetic, magnetic disk. And then to output data, one of the ways to output data will be the printer. Um, in terms of the material, some of the functions include support material, store material, react. So if you, if you put in this material into a specific environment, how would that react? Uh, form material, so if you are going to change the shape or join the material, whether you have to put these materials together or, and also uh, control position. So if you go support material, this could be an airframe. Uh, store material, a shipping container that you use to um, keep things safe. Uh, React material, autoclave, form material, milling machine, join material, all the machine, and so on. And then finally, the energy, which is uh, the function that is used to provide energy or or propulsive power to the system. So some functions, element functions are generate throat, generate torque, generate electricity, control the temperature and control the motion. And here are some applications, turbo jet engine, uh, reciprocating engine, solar cell array, refrigerator, and auto transmission. So as I mentioned already, these are um, things that you can easily say, okay, this is part of this discipline or this discipline. Uh, mostly deals with these functions and also these applications you can see them in, in multiple systems they are not just uh, targeting a specific application they are part of multiple systems which is going back to these uh, three criteria that we discuss so how do you identify uh, the elements must be self-consistent and representative and there are three ways to identify whether or not that's the case. Now let's look, um, so, so far we've been looking at the functions. And as I mentioned last time, functions are important because after you understand the problem that you're trying to solve by developing this new system, you are going to be stating some requirements that the system must perform or the system must satisfy, like the example of the car that you have to design a new car that can fit this many passengers and should give you uh, 30 miles a gallon at least. So you have a system that you need to uh, design 
you are going to state those requirements, such as the ones that I just mentioned, the, the fuel efficiency and the capacity. And using that, those requirements, you're going to start defining functions. So this requirement, how are you going to define, how are you going to achieve this requirement? I need to perform this function. Functions. So class functions, these are some of the classes, and these are some of the elemental functions within each one of those classes. Um, and I also mentioned once you study those functions, then you're going to find a technology that can help you achieve that function. So this is related to that. The application is actually the technology that you're going to be using to achieve that function. And there might be different technology that you can use to achieve that function that you are using to achieve the requirement. When you start looking at different technology, then you start looking at different configurations for your system. And that's how you end up with multiple concepts, right? Um, so that's, that's where we are heading to. So physical building blocks or components, system physical building blocks are the physical embodiments of the functional elements consistent of hardware and software. The classes into which com the components building blocks have been categorized are based on the different design disciplines and the technology that they represent. In total, 31 different component types were identified and grouped into six category categories as shown in Table 3.3. This table is coming from your textbook. Okay, so I'm going to show you that table now. Okay, so these are component design elements. So here are um, the categories electronic, electro optical, electromechanical, mechanical, thermomechanical, and software. And within each category, we have components. So, for example, if you look at the mechanical, we have the framework, container, material processing machine, material reactor, and power transfer device. And then here are the function, functional elements, as we discussed previously, right? So we have, uh, for example, for mechanical framework is to support material. So let's, let me show you how that linked. So here is the function, support material within the material, right? So that's actually linking that into the building blocks. So um, mechanical, the framework, functional element, support material, container, the store material, material processing machine, form joint material, material reactor, reactor material, power transfer device, control and motion. Um, so again, when you start looking at the different functions that your system must perform, you also at some point going to start looking at the building block, the actual material, the actual technology that you're going to be using. And this table can give you uh, an idea in terms of how to define those building blocks from a component design element perspective. So this is the system's perspective, which is linked again back to the discussion that we had in terms of the functions. Okay, so that's in terms of the system building blocks. And again, I'm, I'm going back to mentioning how it is tied together to the goal of the project, which is actually coming with this concept for solving a, a society problem or a problem that is, is relevant for the society. Um, so at some point you're going to start looking at, okay, so I have these requirements, I have these functions, what are the components and what are the functions that this, uh, that I need to perform in order to build a system that will satisfy these requirements. So now, if you remember um, the one of the comments that I made when I when it was we were discussing the case study for the hover satellite, 
that we needed to have good um, interfaces and also perform specific tests in order to know how the system will perform under different environments, making sure that it will perform as expected. So one of the things that we need to always pay attention to is the system environment. So what is the environment in which the system is going to perform and making sure that it's going to behave as expected. So the system environment may be broadly defined as everything outside of the system that interacts with the system. So anything that is going to be interacting with the system that is not part of the system is what we, what we call the environment. The interaction of the system with this environment form the main substance of the system requirements. And it is the responsibility of the system engineer to understand these interactions to make sure that the system requirements accurately reflect the full range of operating conditions. So we want to make sure that when we design our system we are taking into consideration every possible scenario for which the system is going to be put um, into operation. And that's the responsibility of us as systems engineers. Okay, so, um, so everything that is outside the, the system is what would be considered the system environment. Um, so the system boundary defines what is inside the system and what is outside the system. So when we think about the, the boundary, let's say we, we are discussing, I don't know, going back to the car example, everything that is outside the physical embodiment of the car will be considered the, the environment. But also, the, the interior of the car can be considered part of the, on the environment because you're going to have multiple people or a uh, different number of people work uh, inside the car. Uh, you can have different people with different driving behaviors uh, driving the car. So you have to make sure that you are targeting the, the, every possible operating environment for that system to perform. Although defining the system monitoring seems almost trivial at first glance, in practice it is very difficult to identify what is part of the system and what is part of the environment. Different organizations tend to define boundaries differently, even for similar systems. So a very simple illustration, system boundary in this case will be that, that line around the blue area. Um, so there's no energy transfer, there's no mass transfer that within uh, that, air near, inner, that area and the outside. Um, fortunately, several criteria are available to assist in determining whether an entity should be defined as part of the system. The first one is uh, developmental control. And this is, um, these are some questions that we can ask and answer whether or not they're, they're satisfying with this or not. So for instance, does the system developer have control over the entity's development? Um, can the developer influence the requirements of the entity? Or are the requirements defined outside of the developer's spheres of influence? Is, is funding part of the developer budget or is controlled by another organization? So if the answer, if you don't have control over those entities, if you don't have a budget allocated for that entity, um, you don't control that entity, most likely that's not going to be part of your system. So that's going to be part of the uh, environment. Operating control. Once filled, will the entity be under the operational control of the organization that controls the system? Will the tasks and missions performed by the entity by, be directed by the owner or the system, of the system? Will another organization have operational control at times? So as you see that the control part is also under your um, domain, then that might be part of your system. But if it is outside, if those entities are outside, you don't have operational control of them, then they might not be part of your system. Functional allocations. Is the functional, in the functional definition of the system, is the system engineer allowed to allocate functions to the entity? And then finally, unity of purpose. Is the entity dedicated to the system's success? 
once filled, can the entity be removed without objecting by another entity? So, by answering these questions, then you can identify whether or not those entities are part of your system. If the answer is yes, then they are part of your system. If not, they are part of the environment. Um, in terms of the context diagram, an important communication tool uh, available to the systems engineer. This effectively display the external entities and their interactions with the system and instantly allow the reader to identify those external entities. The external entities, they constitute all the entities in which the system will interact. Okay, you don't have control with them. So the system is here and then you're going to have uh, that interaction in terms of input and you also have an interaction in terms of reacting to that input or the system will have an interaction in terms of react, reacting to that input. And that could be in terms of the activity and data, materials and data, uh, signals, energy, as we discussed at the beginning of today's lecture. Okay, so the interaction, that information, that could be materials, that could be activity, that could be data, that could be energy. Um, and here's some context diagrams for a car. Um, so I'm just going back to, this is basically illustrating the application of that diagram that I showed you on the previous slide. So if you look at the car, you have multiple things that are outside the actual system. The energy source, the environment, the maintainer, and, and the users, as I mentioned um, before. So. So the user, for instance, is going to be performing all these things to the system. Steering, braking, acceleration, light commands, window commands, horn activation, security commands, temperature controls, uh, entertainment controls, cargo. So it's going to be performing all these activities and those are going to come as inputs for the car. And then in terms of the reaction from the car, uh, status of the auto states, entertainment, temperature control area, and cargo. You see here, there's no feedback, right? When you're putting the energy source, it goes straight to the system. Feedback to the, uh, to the energy source is, is not existent, right? Uh, even though the car is going to be generating some type of gas or, or um, yes. So CO2, for instance, um, that's not going back to the energy source. That's not going to back to the gas station, right? Um, so that's why it's not depicted here. Um, but that's part of the environment, right? So you're gonna, the environment is going to provide some support, resistance, and weather, and then you are going to give some um, feedback in terms of heat, uh, the exhaust system, as I mentioned, and lights. So very, um, this context diagram <coughs> actually give you an idea of, again, understanding what's going to be part of your system and what's going to be part of the environment. Is you need to set up this boundary. Um, so in order to make sure that you are uh, designing the appropriate system and you are not uh, spending time on things that are not going to be part of your system. And again, understanding these questions helps you find out whether or not the, the things that you're considering uh, are part of the system or they are not. If they are not part of the system, then you're putting them as part of the environment. If they are part of the environment, then your next step is to consider how to make sure that your system is going to be operating as expected with the, all these inputs coming from the environment. <coughs> so there different types of environment interactions. There are primary interactions which represent functional inputs, outputs, and controls. And there are secondary interactions which are elements that are that interact with the system in an indirect, non-functional manner, such as physical support, ambient temperature, and so on. So there are, again, two types of interactions with the environment those that are going to have an impact in terms of the functions of your system and the secondary interactions 
<clears throat> they are interacting in an indirect way. Okay, they are not necessarily putting in a changing the way the system is going to be behaving. And I showed you an example here for um, this uh, airplane and the environment. So there's a flight environment in which you are going to have information being passed through the flight command uh, towers. And then you have the environment also affecting the, the aircraft. So we have the rain, the wind, the turbulence. Um, the landing environment, the support environment, this could be considered a uh, secondary interaction. It is not affecting the performance of the system. You're just taking down the, the luggage, putting back new luggage, and also um, putting some gas and so on. Uh, passengers, that can have an effect. Uh, the amount of passengers that you are bringing inside the, the, the aircraft can have an impact in terms of how much gas you need to put into the aircraft and so on. Um, and then the maintenance environment. And then we get into the last part of this uh, lecture, which is the interfaces and interactions. So interfaces and interactions Interfaces are very important, as I show, uh, as I mentioned, um, based on the previous examples that we have this uh, discussing class. Um, interaction between two individual elements of the system are affected through the interface between them. Example: the interface between a car driver hands and the steering wheel enables the driver to to guide the car, and also transmits a force that turns the steering wheel and thereby the car's wheel. So there are some interactions happening within the driver and the car, but there's an interface that helps that or makes that happen. In this case, the steering uh, wheel. An example, another example, interface between the tires of the car and the road, both propel the car and they transmit driving traction to the road. And as you can see, there are multiple, uh, there are different type of tires, depending on, on how, you, or what are the expectations for you as a driver. Um, so different, different type of tires will give you different type of traction on the road. Okay, so that's an interface. So my question to you is what, type, what interfaces, interactions are involved in brake pedal and braking of the car? So what is the interaction that is going to happen between that interface, which is the brake pedal, when, once you push it, what is the interaction? What is that doing to the car? Do you know? What's happening once you push that brake pedal? Stops the car, but what? Yes. So by pushing that, you're making a pressure. There's, there's a hydraulic system that is going to be sending some of that um, liquid or brake fluid into the lines, and they the paths are going to move. And the, the, the interaction is that the paths are going to contract, right? And they're going to stop that disc that is doing the rotation of the tires. So by just pushing that, you're creating that whole interaction with your car. So <clears throat> the interface is the brake pedal, but the interaction is the actual movement of the paths. Um, for the break in, in the brake desk. Functional interactions are affected by physical interactions that flow across physical interfaces. And here's again the example of the airplane. Um, so a function, you have a command, then you move the the airplane and you, I mean, you move the, 
the airlong, which is this part of the of the wing, in order to make it fly or stop it. And based on what you want to do, what based on that function, then you are going to have some deflection. <coughs> so functional interaction, you have area deflection, three degrees per degree of six motion. So you have the physical interfaces, this person, the controller, making uh, an announcement or transmitting information through the antenna. <coughs> that's going to be received by the by the airplane, and then that's going to um, power the amp and drive rotor in order to move this iron to decide whether you want to move faster or not with the airplane. So you see information being transferred that's creating an interaction with the environment. <coughs> external system interaction, an important but sometimes not adequately addressed external system interaction occurs during maintenance, um, where you have access to vital system functions for testing purposes, uh, special test points of the system, um, can be a sample externally, um, for example, um, there are some washing machines now that you can call if you have a problem with them. You can call the service uh, department and you can press a button on the washing machine and they will beep. They will create like a beep sound and ba based on that beep sound that they hear through the phone, they can diagnose your, your machine. Um, so that's an example of something that can be sampled externally. Um, in some complex systems, you incorporate an extended set of built-in tests, or BITs, um, which can be exercised with your system within operation, and the design of such interfaces is also the concern of the systems engineer. So, I don't know how many of you, uh, when you get a problem with your car, you try to uh, figure out before you take it to the mechanic, but uh, the, the car has a lot of building test um, ports that you can use to diagnose the problems. That, that's why when you, I don't know if you have heard the announcement or the um, marketing of some of these auto parts that they say you, you can bring your car and we will diagnose it for free. What they do is they, they use one of these building test ports and they connect a the machine and based on, on the diagnosis, they can tell you, oh, maybe this is this is a problem, this is a problem, or this is a problem. That's what mechanics do as well. But um, that is something that can you do on your own as well. They sell those machines on Amazon, for instance, and they're not very expensive. So, and, and, and that's there, and that's been designed by a systems engineer in order to make sure that you have a way to diagnose your system really quick. So you can fix it and put it into operation. Problem is, if you don't design for those, and you have a very complex system, you might need to put everything apart in order to find out if something is, is wrong. Um, so designing for those building tests is really important. So to systemize the identification of external and internal interfaces, we will distinguish three types, uh, connectors, isolators, and converters. And there are examples of interfaces elements. There are the type, the three types that are listed here, interaction, isolator, and converter. And then we have four different types so, for example, for electrical, the interaction or the medium will be the current. Um, for connectors, that could be the cable or the switch. For the isolator, that could be a shield isolator, insulator, sorry, and the converter could be the antenna. Um, for mechanical, we have the force for the interaction medium. For the connection, it could be the joint co uh, coupling. The isolator could be a shock mount bearing. So every time you take a, um, let's say, a hole in the street, you get that joint that's protecting the system uh, so you don't get hit and get broke uh, or break the, the area. The converter, gear train piston, um, 
and then the hydraulic and the human machine. The human machine information is the interaction. Connector is the display or control panel. The isolator is the cover or window, and the converter is the keyboard. Okay, so that's the last slide that I have for today's lecture. The last part of this uh, assignment and or, or this lecture today is I want you to go and, and go online and, and read a little bit about two different case studies uh, related to space um, problems. These are two questions that I want you to, to answer. Uh, what caused the Space Shuttle Challenger disaster on January 28, 1986? And what caused the Space Shuttle Columbia disaster on February 1, 2003? Um, and then there are other, uh, this is a third case study that I want you to uh, research a little bit. <coughs> This is about the Boeing 787 Dreamliner, which was a long-range, mid-side, wide-body wide body, twin-engine jet airline developed by Boeing Commercial Airplanes. Its first flight was December 15, 2009, and was introduced into service in October 26, 2011. After a series of onboard fires earlier uh, this month, that happened in January 2013, however, the F AA on January 16 ordered all airlines to ground their fleets until airplane on both batteries are proven safe to operate. The order followed Japan Airlines grounding its 787 after a battery fire forced the evacuation of all Nippon Airways flights. So I want you to look at this uh, case study as well or this uh, and perform a quick search on the topic on the internet and answer the questions in the assignment. These are the questions in the assignment, okay? So the, the instructions, I did it on purpose. You will, you will find the questions on, on, on the assignment tab. If you go to tracks, you'll find these questions there. Um, so you can start working on those right now. The assignment is going to be due on Monday. Um, and then on Monday, we will have a discussion um, based on, on your answers for these questions. Uh, so again, just answer this quickly. What caused the Space Shuttle Challenger disaster? Obviously, this is going to be um, related to our discussion today. You'll see that there were some problems with the interfaces um, for both of them. And see what happened with this Boeing 787. This was five years ago. Um, so these are problems that are happening. Um, might not know about them, but these, these are pretty recent. Um, so if you go to the assignment tabs, you can find the, the questions listed there. So you can open the, win the Word document and answer the questions right there, and then upload the, the answers to your assignment tab or to your assignment um, link and make sure that you do that before Monday at the beginning of the class time. 